Speaking on Elliot is a difficult matter, for he is long and gone and can't pen a rebuttal. And being a cat should my opinion even matter, though he made claims about us that weren't even subtle. We're white and we're black and we're medium-sized. We're three-named and blind and possess jeweled eyes. But did Elliot ask a cat how we self-identify? I am but a cat. I have but one name, and all of them mine, not for human eyes. And if Elliot so boldly laid us to claim, allow a cat to rebuttal with my thoughts on his lies. Yeah, I have a lot to say about Cats, but I can't say that I didn't enjoy it. Somehow. Cats is a movie about anthropomorphic cat people who are constantly aroused. It's a movie about a highly stratified, very traditional feline society, which also happens to be a ritualistic death cult. Meow! It's a movie that defies visual description with uncanny computer-generated effects, bizarre body movement, and distracting camera work. So the 2019 version of Cats is a story of a very ordered society told in the most jarring way imaginable. Spoiler alert, although I think spoiling this movie is kind of impossible, it's like spoiling a psychedelic mushroom trip, but what little plot there is involves a group of cats coming together for something called the Jellico Ball, which is a talent show where the winner, chosen by old Deuteronomy, will die and be reborn. Confused? Don't worry, I saw both the 1998 DVD version and the 2019 theatrical version multiple times, and I'm still confused. Cats is also based on the poetry of the godfather of modern poetry, T.S. Eliot. Most of the lyrics are derived from Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, which is full of children's poetry that Eliot wrote to his younger relatives, then compiled for publication in 1939. Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats fits into a subgenre of children's book that details the physical and personality traits of different races. It does for cats what a book like Bozo and His Rocket Ship did for humans, which was published in the 40s. It assigns stereotypical, cartoonish traits to various human cultures around the world. Books like this were designed to teach kids that different types of people fit into different predefined categories. Or to put it more bluntly, they're designed to teach harmful racist stereotypes to children. Meow. Speaking of old school racism and institutionalized violence, T.S. Eliot also happened to be a fascist sympathizer. He did reject the label fascist, but don't get me wrong, he didn't reject fascism in favor of anti-fascism. Instead, Eliot labeled himself a royalist. He was a devout Christian and identified as Anglo-Catholic, which is an ultra-conservative movement that argued for the supreme authority of the Church of England. Eliot did not believe in the separation of church and state, but rather the superiority of the church over the state. Between his royalism and Anglican faith, Eliot believes that kings are literally chosen by God to lead a country. In Eliot's brand of royalist thinking, the body of the king represents both the human manifestation of God on earth and the personification of the state. The king is the head of the state to the metaphorical body politic. Even today, the British monarch holds the title of Supreme Governor of the Church of England, and the canon law of the Church of England states, We acknowledge that the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, acting according to the laws of the realm, is the highest power under God in this kingdom and has supreme authority over all persons in all causes, as well ecclesiastical as civil. And here in America, there is a terrifying and indisputable rise in royalism and Christian dominionism. The idea of democracy offended T.S. Eliot, since democracy implies that everyone has basic human rights and that everyone deserves a say in politics. He was a big fan of Charles Murris, the anti-Semitic, anti-parliamentist philosopher who happens to be a hero of Steve Bannon. Eliot was also buddies with countless awful people, like Wyndham Lewis, who described Hitler as a man of peace. Of course, Eliot wasn't just a fan of anti-Semites. He was also a vocal anti-Semite himself, often saying things that sound like it could have been pulled straight from a Richard Spencer blog post. In his lecture series, After Strange Gods, he outlined what he thought was the right way to organize society, that being a bunch of ethno-nationalist states where race mixing is not allowed, and everyone is segregated by race and religion. The population should be homogenous. Where two or more cultures exist in the same place, they are likely either to be fiercely self-conscious or both to become adulterate. What is still more important is unity of religious background. 
and reasons of race and religion combine to make any large number of free-thinking Jews undesirable. And on whether he'd be okay with those ethnostates tolerating one another, he continues. A spirit of excessive tolerance is to be deprecated. When it comes to bigotry, Eliot showed what we in the 21st century would call his whole ass. In Eliot's worldview, you are merely a cell within the larger organism that is the king's body that we call society. And if that body gets sick, how does royalism respond? Well, in 1988, Prince Philip, husband of Queen Elizabeth, said this. In the event that I am reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus to contribute something to solving overpopulation. Royalism's end goal will always be for the king to hold the power. Democracy's end goal is for the people to hold the power. Fascism uses the mass appeal of a popular movement like democracy to achieve its end goal of a dictator holding power. Fascism is just royalism with a little thing we millennials like to call a rebrand. Love a good rebrand. Ah! The overlap between royalism and fascist-leaning conservatives in the United States has been present in conservative propaganda since forever. <laughs> From Donald Trump joking about never stepping down for the presidency to Liberty Hangout, the group that Gun Girl is a part of tweeting this. It is far more preferable to live under a monarchy than a democracy. Democracy is mob rule of the government estate and is a soft form of communism. To the dedication in Ann Coulter's 1998 book, High Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Case Against Bill Clinton, where she writes, For my parents, who see virtues in the British system. Okay. In today's political terms, Elliot would have aligned with the Christian far right, have a photo of Thanos on his Twitter, and his own weekly column in Quillette where he compares celebrity skull shapes. Yes, Elliot may have wanted a king rather than a fascist dictator, but whether you call your tyrant your majesty or mein Führer or queen mom, what difference does it make to the people who are repressed by that regime? So it's no coincidence that Cats contains a hell of a lot of fascist imagery and ideology, but like, for kids. To start, let's compare Cats to Umberto Eco's essay, Er Fascism, where he laid out 14 properties associated with fascist ideology. He argues that only one of these features need to be present for fascism to thrive. Most obviously, there's the whole death cult thing, where death is ritualized and glorified with the promise of rebirth. Fascist leaders encourage the masses to seek out death through military service or stochastic terrorism. Very fasci. There's the cult of tradition as a means of denying progress in favor of reinforcing old power structures. Instead of using the scientific method to discover new knowledge or using rational thought to arrive at reasonable conclusions, the cult of tradition demands that you look back to the the past for all the answers. According to Umberto Eco, There can be no advancement of learning. Truth has already been spelled out once and for all, and we can only keep interpreting its obscure message. Much like the Jellicoe Ball, whose message is, if anything, obscure. <laughs> There's popular elitism, which argues that we the people are the chosen people. I believe you truly are a Jellicoe cat. Ah yes, the Jellicoe cats. Much more important than all of the other cats. <laughs> we also see the characterization of old Deuteronomy as the patriarch. Or in the case of the movie, it's a matriarch, but with exactly the same position, power, and assumption of absolute privilege. Am I saying that Cats is inherently fascist? No. Am I saying that Tom Hooper, the director of the 2019 Cats, is a fascist? No. Am I saying that Andrew Lloyd Webber, the composer and producer of Cats, is a fascist? No. At least not provably. I am saying that both versions of Cats are based on writings by an extreme bigot, and elements of his bigotry and his fascist sympathies are folded into the meaning of the play and therefore the film. The original poems contain child-friendly, sanitized versions of Eliot's beliefs, and the play and the musical sanitize them even further, even if they're unrecognizable at first glance. More importantly for us, the audience, is it okay to enjoy Cats, considering its problematic origins and the fashy ideas behind it? Well, first off, a lot of the songs fucking slap, and that is always good. But what I really like about Cats the stage musical, 
despite its fascist inspired origins and its weirdly ritualized death cult, is watching these incredible dancers, actors, and singers come together in a performance that celebrates the human body and what it's capable of feels really liberating. It's an example of content being in conflict with style. The style of the original stage play was already at direct odds with Elliot's fashy ideas, and I loved it. Pesto. And now, the 2019 version, Elliot's fashy ideas are yet another step removed. This time, extra, extra removed, thanks to the hyper alienating CGI and bad costumes. The result is a movie so abstracted, so inane, so unrelatable. It's a kind of accidental parody of those same fascist beliefs. And the best movie to watch when you're coming down from a mushroom trip. Or maybe the worst, I'll get back to you on that. This liberating feeling that I get from Cats emerges from that conflict between the original source material and the 1998 play version. The tension between the play's stuffy, fascist origins and the weird kinetic dancing that celebrates the human body. And I am legally allowed to speak on this because I got an A plus in modern dance class, which yes, was a prerequisite and Yes, was the only dance class that I took in college. So, there's two reasons why I love the dancing. First, I love the dancing and the body language for its own sake. Body language is heavily policed in our society. Restricting our body language is one of the first ways that we're conditioned by society to behave to fit in and to signify our class. Many of the first rules that we learn as children dictate the way that we sit, stand, and move through the room. You're told to sit still, and not just told to sit still, but how to sit still. Every aspect of our body language gets critiqued, not only by adults, but by our peers too. Even the way that you throw a ball can be characterized as throwing like a girl. We assign gender markers to actions that have nothing to do with our gender, and then we restrict those actions to specific groups. What we're allowed to express with our body language depends on our status in society. Even the way that we look at someone can be considered offensive. Just think back to when you were a kid and adults would threaten you, don't you dare give me that look. The cat's fluid, expressive body movements break free from those constraints. Their bodies become a means of expressing emotion rather than an object that contains our emotions. And that's kind of what I love about dance in general. In fact, the reason that I got an A plus in my modern dance class was because I had no formal dance training. Other students who had grown up perfecting ballet poses and difficult tap dancing configurations had a lot of trouble unlearning those more rigid body movements. I had no trouble because I was terrible at regular dancing. So terrible, in fact, that I was laughed out of the department's general audition a month before. This modern dance class was the first time I didn't feel like a total failure because I hadn't attended a private arts high school. I did, however, play a lot of sports in high school and my modern dance teacher effing loved it. Our teacher would be like, move across the floor any way you want. And that freedom was difficult for a lot of people to deal with since this was supposed to be a dance class. It was honestly just pure luck that our teacher loved my skinny chicken arms and that I couldn't pirouette to save my life. But she was a brilliant modern dance teacher who instilled in me this idea of unlearning the right way to move, the right way to be, and learning that every muscle, every gesture, no matter how unconventional, could be used to express something. Modern dance offers a type of freedom that personally spoke to me. And when I see cats on stage, I'm amazed by the beautiful ballet and tap choreography, as well as the moments when it honors weird body movements that remind me there's no right way to be. And secondly, I love the dancing because T.S. Eliot would have hated the dancing. Eliot was very concerned with the decline of cis heterosexual culture. His most famous poems all deal with the fear that men were turning into soy boys which might give you the impression that T.S. Eliot was a Chad, but the reality, as far as I can tell, is that he was pretty meek. He wore pale makeup so that he would look more like a corpse, which I guess made him some sort of conservative goth. He was terrified of women, even just the sight of a woman. His biography on TSElliot.com notes that when he was at Oxford, if a female student walked into the same room as him, he couldn't even look at her. If seeing a woman enter a classroom was upsetting enough to make him turn away, I'm pretty sure watching this would have made him spontaneously combust. 
When Elliot finally did marry his first wife, Vivian, it was a disaster. Vivian and Elliot's friend, Bertrand Russell, had an affair behind Elliot's back, and he eventually committed Vivian to a mental hospital against her will until she died. And then when he was 68, he remarried his 30-year-old secretary. Meow. The more of Elliot's poetry you read, and the more you read about his sex life, the more you realize that he was just a miserable curmudgeon who was terrified of sex and women, and therefore hated both. He was so violently upset by even the thought of interacting with a woman that he would experience what he called nervous sexual attacks. And I do want to be sensitive to the fact that there are some people who have experienced trauma, which leads them to fear sex. Or some people are simply aromantic or asexual, and I think that's dope. But T.S. Eliot's outlook feels uncomfortably similar to a modern-day MRA, or even a violent incel. Seriously, we've read tons and tons of his poetry and a bunch of books about him to research this video, and literally every detail we learn about him reveals yet another layer of his weird misogyny. For example, Eliot's poem, The Love Song of St. Sebastian, contains these lovely lines. I would come in a hair shirt, I would come with a lamp in the night, and sit at the foot of your stair. I would flog myself until I bled, I would come with a towel in my hands, and bend your head beneath my knees. You would love me because I should have strangled you, and because of my infamy. And I should love you the more because I mangled you, and because you were no longer beautiful to anyone but me. Now, I'm just as into kink as the next girl, but this is not kink. He's romanticizing an abusive relationship. And it's also like, was all you had to do to be a successful writer in the 1920s was just release your private live journal poetry? Elliot also strictly adhered to rules about what physical actions men or women were allowed to enjoy. To Elliot, men were supposed to penetrate, and women were supposed to be penetrated. And not just penetrated by wieners, but even if that penetration is done by a weapon. Elliot wrote those lines from the Love Song of St. Sebastian after viewing these three paintings in various galleries in Europe. The paintings depict St. Sebastian being martyred. As biographer Lyndall Gordon explained in her book Elliot's Early Years, The three paintings show innocent, firm-fleshed youths exposed to penetrant arrows. In a letter to Conrad Eichen, Elliot noted the eroticism and emphasized that, for him, a female saint would have been more appropriate. That is literally a painting of someone being murdered. But Elliot looked at those arrows and thought, hey, that's my wiener. So that should be a woman. What? Elliot was so obsessed with sex and the gender binary, he had to project his obsessions onto what is supposed to be a religious spiritual image. Ew. And Elliot is a seminal figure in Western writing. I cannot stress enough how much influence this guy, with his bananas ideas, have had on how we English-speaking people view art, or who has the right to create art, or what that art should say or portray. The values that the Western canon reflects lead directly back to Elliot's sick fetishes and f***ed up live journal posts. By the way, T.S. Elliot, I know you think only women can be penetrated, but really missing out. <laughs> so yeah, Elliot would have recoiled at the sight of horny cats joyfully dancing to his poetry. And I love the fact that a movie based on Elliot's poetry conflicts so dramatically with his source material. By the time we get to the current iteration of Cats, Elliot's original meaning is a bit muddled. From the baffling off-the-cuff cutaways. Oh no, look what the cat oh. dragged in. To the static Cooper shots that stop the action in place. To the widely different acting style choices. All of these aspects obscure T.S. Eliot's work to the point of parody. We now have rowdy screenings where we meow at the screen and lap up milk and throw glitter into the air when T. Swift shakes her catnip bottle. We laugh at the exposed human hands. We laugh because it seems to make no sense. So it's kind of perfect because on a literal pragmatic level, fascism is absurd. It makes no sense. It's inherently self-contradictory by design. It demands that you deceive yourself about the world around you, and then it demands that you live in that denial. Elliot also loved stillness. Elliot's poetry is very static, very still, lacking in movement. The imagery in his poems often tends towards death, decay, and rot. In The Poetics of Fascism, a deep dive into the fascist ideologies in the work of T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, Paul Morrison writes, Eliot privileges stillness. 
But this stillness isn't just a lack of physical motion. It has larger cultural implications. Morrison continues, He is thus opposed to any poetic that maintains or exacerbates the tension between the socially actual and desirable, between what is and what might be. Ellie doesn't want just the human body to remain still. He wants all of culture, all of society to remain still. And his poetic grammar reflects that. He's a poet who refuses to imagine a different or better world, which kind of seems like it defeats the purpose of writing poetry, but okay. Meow. Although Eliot eventually moved to England and renounced his American passport, he was born in America. The history of America is a history of cis, straight, white, land-owning men policing bodies, most explicitly in the genocide carried out by European colonizers against the people already living in America, and the slave trade, where black bodies were stripped of autonomy and even personal identity, then ordered to perform specific types of labor, as if their bodies were viewed as one part of a larger machine. So the baseline reality in American history has always been, people in power have the right to manipulate your body more than you have the right to manipulate your own. And this power dynamic continues today, in how how black and other marginalized bodies are policed by the police, or how reproductive rights are policed by men, or how TERFs try to exclude trans bodies from public spaces. TERFs have taken the policing of body language to such a literal degree. They want your genitals to be the sole determining factor of your entire future. From the tiniest flick of the wrist being used to condemn someone as gay, to the wrong kind of look being used as proof that someone is a psychopathic pervert, or the way that my own voice and face are labeled as trans by creeps in the comment section even though I'm cis. We are constantly told that we can't simply exist in physical space. We must exist in the appropriate way. In the Middle Ages in Europe, these kinds of rules about how to present yourself in public were codified in the sumptuary laws, which governed what kinds of clothes different genders or social classes were allowed to wear. It was a way to order society at the whims of the monarch. But since we Westerners really excel at internalizing behavior that causes self-harm, we learn to enforce these customs on ourselves. Self-policing language is baked into our everyday interactions. The theorist Thomas Yingling gave this description of how we reinforce society's values, specifically through our body language. The problem of signs of the homosexual is inescapable. One is taught young, for instance, that homosexuality is semiotic and that there are signs of it and that one ought not to produce those signs. Even as children, perhaps especially as children, gays are taught to hide their own signs and substitute those of the dominant culture. Boys who are sissies internalize quite early that the signs of their sissyhood are, absurdly, for they seem self-produced and contingent with identity, their enemy. They may in fact recognize that those who object to these signs are also enemies, but the outcome is more often than not the repression of signs of sissyhood, assuming here that children have not yet the code words gay or homosexual. One false, and therefore true, sign is enough to bring on danger in certain situations, literal exposure to persecution. So the problematic of the sign is forced upon the homosexual at an early age, and in a manner that differs, experientially, from that detailed, for instance, in Afro-American texts. For there the sign of difference, blackness, is not considered to be within one's control. So even though moving your own body in a certain way may feel more natural to you, we're taught to fear this bodily self-expression in the mirror and in others. Through childish bullying, we alienate ourselves from our own bodies. Then alienate other people since we're conditioned to make value judgments based on how they move, how they look, how they dress, or how they carry themselves. This idea really gets to the heart of why some people were upset at the straight washing of the magical Mr. Mistopheles character. In the live musical version, Mr. Mistopheles was this beautiful, unbridled expression of body language. And in the new version, he's explicitly straight and just so happens to not have any of that same expressive body movement. Hollywood limits bodily expression by typecasting actors who look a particular way. Deformity and disability are associated with mental illness, impotence, or evil. Heroism and virtue are associated with good looks. In film, comedy and horror are the two main genres that allow extreme bodily expression. Comedy allows the body to be penetrable, to be gross, to be deformed or smushed into odd positions. 
But in comedy, the body also usually bounces back. Physical manipulation is temporary, which gives us a sense of relief in the end. We are reassured that the body will heal. In horror, however, the body is penetrable, gross, deformed, and smush, but these unsettling body movements are used to terrify us. In horror, the body does not bounce back. Mutilation is permanent, and it explores our fear of mortality. One example I want to point out is in The Silence of the Lambs. Buffalo Bill is demonized because the character both transgresses traditional gender roles by skinning a woman alive to wear her skin and yearning for a female identity, and traditional well-behaved society by being a weirdo recluse. In contrast, Hannibal gains the trust of those same people because, while having committed almost the exact same crimes as Buffalo Bill, he doesn't transgress his traditional gender roles. He skins a man alive, thank you very much, and does it in a very manly way, and traditional well-behaved society. Hannibal has the mannerisms and co-ops the signs of being a gentleman. Lecter uses civilized body language as a means of making us not only identify with him, but even empathize with him and root for him. On a literal level, their physical crimes are remarkably similar, but on a symbolic level, their social crimes are polar opposites. Yes, the crowd will cheer for a serial killer, or a war criminal, or a tyrant, as long as that monster speaks with a particular cadence, dresses in a particular way, and regurgitates particular euphemisms to excuse their own violent, abusive behavior. While certain genres benefit from stillness or use it for a particular effect, one genre that is usually full of movement and expression is musicals, which is another weird thing about Cats 2019. Tom Hooper loves shooting static close-ups during some of the more dramatic songs for some ungodly reason. These are my least favorite shots in the whole movie, and they bring the energy to a dead halt. In these shots, you can feel the actors struggling against the stilted, unnatural framing, and it's a bummer to see Tom Hooper's shot selection sabotage these actors' performances. Cats are famously unmoved by others, each cat its own king of its own land. Socialists we'd be called by others, a bad word I've heard when uttered by men. Even if you haven't seen Cats, you've probably heard that it's basically two hours of cat characters introducing themselves and then singing songs about their own ridiculous names and what they do in their spare time. The silly name motif is one of the many things about Cats that Feels random and pointless at first, but when we dig deeper, we see that it fits right into Elliot's stratified view of the universe. Elliot didn't see names as private property. To him, your name is inherent to your identity, handed down to you from your parents, whose parents handed it down to them, and so on and so on. In the Poetics of Fascism, Morrison writes, Names mean, or are one of the means, whereby the subject is initially placed, put in its place, in relation to the social, which our culture tends to manage through the reproduction of family names. From birth, we are labeled by our parents, and these labels are spoken so casually, so matter-of-factly, that they end up being baked into our self-identity, especially for a firstborn son who is given their father's full name. Like the way that kings will assume names like William II or Henry VIII when they take the crown. They are folding their identities backwards in history, laying claim to the identities of their forefathers, or even to people that they have no relation to. By extension, these kings and queens lay claim to all those previous people's lands, properties, and divine rights. It's just one of the many ways that people in power use language to perpetuate their power, or as Morrison puts it, to reproduce the world as it has been conventionally produced. Which makes it even more infuriating that Ray is a Palpatine. In this essay, I will expose. This reproduction of the status quo is woven into the very fabric of the T.S. Eliot poems that Katz is based on. Morrison writes, Humankind is enjoined to recognize, not invent, spiritual realities. And so the naming of Katz is finally about the recognition, not the giving, of names. Fascists obsess over names, especially Jewish names. Like the way that they'll use triple parentheses around a Jewish name online to signal the twisted idea that Jewish names echo throughout history for their supposed crimes. So to someone like Elliot, your name reveals a deeper truth about your identity, about your family lineage, and about your place in society. 
We see this with Skimbleshanks the railway cat, whose identity is bound to his job. He doesn't just work for the rail line, he is of the railway train, and everything we learn about him is simply the details of his job. I can imagine Elliot sitting on a train, watching the ticket agent collecting the tickets, and Elliot is just totally unable to imagine that the ticket agent has any life beyond the walls of the train car. To Elliot, that working class person is nothing more than a function of the train that Elliot is paying to ride, simply a part of the larger machine. One very important name that Elliot uses to perpetuate the past is Old Deuteronomy. Elliot pulled the name Deuteronomy from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy is set right before the Israelites enter the Promised Land. The laws that were first codified in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers are reiterated and expanded upon in the book of Deuteronomy. The meaning of the word Deuteronomy even points to the idea that the book is a copy, a repetition, or a reproduction of those same laws. So, the character Old Deuteronomy represents the law, physically manifested in the body of the king. But more importantly, try to imagine the book of Deuteronomy from Eliot's point of view. From his point of view, or someone like Mike Pence, or any other militant theocrat who sees the church as superior to the state, Deuteronomy describes an ethnostate where religion and law are one. It's their fantasy, man. There is no freedom without the law. To defy one's leader, who embodies the law, is to defy the Lord God himself. Rhetorically, that leader becomes God, and we see this idea reflected in fascist propaganda. Like in the 1930s when a Nazi pastor used this slogan during a confirmation service. He who serves Hitler serves Germany. He who serves Germany serves God. Don't question me, or you're questioning God, okay? In Cats, all of the characters, without exception, seem to view their society as a given, as simply the way it is. They are seemingly unaware that their society is constructed and that it's absolute wacky town. None of these cats ask, who am I? Or what does this all mean? Or why does this Deuteronomy guy get to pick who goes to the heavy side lair? The entire play is them saying, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am, and this is what I do, this is what I do, this is what I do. Even the villain McCavity isn't trying to disrupt the hierarchy, he's simply trying to become the one who benefits from the hierarchy. He's the Joe Biden of the Cats universe. As a royalist and a traditionalist, Elliot believed that there was an ideal structure for society, an order dictated by God himself. One that involved a divinely inspired king at the top and the unwashed masses at the bottom. In his poetry, Elliot often describes a world that's crumbling, a world that's about to end. Elliot didn't feel like the world was crumbling around him because of the mass destruction and countless death brought about by World War I. He felt like the world was crumbling because kings and their families were literally being killed off by revolutions, and the idea of a society without a king to tell everyone what to do was terrifying to him. In 1918, just as Eliot's career as a writer was really taking off, World War I ended. As a result, the German monarchy was abolished under the new constitution. And also in 1918, Nicholas II, the last emperor of Russia, was executed along with his entire royal family. This is the summary of their execution from Wikipedia. Nikolai was shot several times in the chest. Anastasia, Tatiana, Olga, and Maria survived the first hail of bullets. The sisters were wearing over 1.3 kilograms of diamonds and precious gems soon into their clothing, which provided some initial protection from the bullets and bayonets. First they were stabbed with bayonets, and then shot at close range in their heads. That description is a nightmare. Even to someone like me, who thinks royalty is inherently immoral and corrupt. And to someone like Elliot, who believed that a country's royal family is the physical embodiment of that country, killing off a royal family was the equivalent of wiping an entire country off of the map. It would be apocalyptic. Elliot doesn't weep for the death of the modern world. He doesn't weep for the soldiers or civilians who died in World War I. He weeps for the death of a handful of inbred authoritarian tyrants whose bejeweled grip on world politics was slipping. That's why Katz has repeated references to the good old days of Queen Victoria. It's why Elliot says that we should be proud to be nodded to or bowed to by Bustopher Jones. It's why Elliot characterizes Old Deuteronomy as not just a leader, but as a kingly father who spreads his seed to create his noble cat society. Yes, the society in cats is bizarrely inbred, just like a royal family. To sum up my hot take, cats is royalist propaganda, but poorly made, so it's wonderful.
No. Hey, no, I'm serious. Hey, come on! Between the world wars, Eliot was one of the most highly regarded critics of literature in the West, and he knew it. Here's Eliot writing to a friend in 1919. As it is, I occupy rather a privileged position. My social position is quite as good as it would be as editor of a paper. I only write what I want to now, and everyone knows that anything I do write is good. I can influence London opinion and English literature in a better way. I am known to be disinterested. There is a small and select public which regards me as the best living critic as well as the best living poet in England. I really think that I have far more influence in English letters than any other American has ever had, unless it be Henry James. I know a great many people, but there are many more who would like to know me, and I can remain isolated and detached. Eliot uses words like isolated and detached, as if those are good things for a critic to be, and I couldn't agree less. But what I want to point out is how those words isolated and detached, they aren't expressive or personal. It sounds more like a self-imposed prison sentence. And notice how Eliot takes on this attitude of, it's lonely at the top, as if he's positioned himself as the king of poetry. Throughout his career, he repeats this idea that he has the right to render final judgment on writing. For example, in After Strange Gods, the same anti-Semitic lecture series I mentioned earlier, Eliot reassures the reader that he only cites worthy authors. I am sure that those of whom I have discussed are among the best, and for my purposes, the second rate were useless. Eliot gets to decide what is good poetry and bad poetry. If your work doesn't align with his values, it's not just bad writing. To someone like Eliot, it means that your writing is useless and you're probably a bad person. You might even be bringing about the fall of Western civilization. And Eliot's words did carry power and authority. As a critic and publisher, he absolutely had power over which poems and novels might live or die. I want to decide who lives and who dies. Oh, I don't know. I think we can draw a very important comparison here between the way that our society privileges stillness in body language and the way that Eliot privileges stillness in writing. Not just his own writing, but the entire Western canon. By freezing our body language, society discourages us from expressing ourselves and makes it harder to bring about change, progress, and revolution. Eliot used his status as a critic and poet to freeze language, writing, and culture in order to control what people read and what they thought about writing. In tradition and the individual talent, Eliot even goes so far as to say there are literally only two types of emotions you can feel, the ordinary or the perverse. One error, in fact, of eccentricity in poetry is to seek for new emotions to express, and in this search for novelty in the wrong place, it discovers the perverse. The business of the poet is not to find new emotions, but to use the ordinary ones, and in working them up into poetry, to express feelings which are not in actual emotions at all. Poetry is not a turning loose of emotions, but an escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. But, of course, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things. <laughs> In Eliot's view, a poet must limit themselves to ordinary, socially acceptable emotions. It's yet another example of how he tries to reproduce the world as it has been conventionally produced. In this view, if feelings of, say, homoerotic love aren't already visible in public, that's because they must be perverse and therefore are not valid emotions. Ordinary. Perverse. Ordinary. Perverse. And notice how whenever Ellie describes someone or something that he doesn't like, he uses language with implicit bias, like the word perverse. I wonder why he would do that. As the political scientist E.E. E. Schatzneider wrote, the definition of the alternatives is the supreme instrument of power. The antagonist can rarely agree on what the issues are because power is involved in the definition. He who determines what politics is runs the country because the definition of alternatives is the choice of conflicts and the choice of conflicts allocates power. Similarly, Elaine Scarry writes in her book The Body in Pain, 
Political power entails the power of self-description. This is why internet trolls and alt-right weirdos spend so much time insulting you with weird euphemisms or denouncing you in long, judgmental statements that have nothing to do with the argument at hand. They're interested in limiting the boundaries of the larger debate and assigning moral value judgments to their opponents' identities. Think of the way that conservatives label anyone they don't like as terrorists. From nonviolent, peaceful protesters to anti-fascists, terrorists simply comes to mean anyone who disagrees with me. Then think of the way that Blackwater employees who literally travel across the world to massacre innocent civilians get labeled neutral terms like contractors. Or think of the way that the word oligarchs is now apparently a slur against rich people. People in power, good! Regular people, bad. And this binary thinking is integral to the poetic grammar of cats. Everything is either this or that. There's no room for nuance, no personality, no complexity. Your memory I'll jog and say a cat is not a dog. You are ordered to categorize different races. Cats are this, dogs are that. And this order to categorize is told to you as if it's from your own memory. Your memory, I will jog. But if it really was a true memory, and if it really was a deeper truth, then we wouldn't need the reminder. This relates back to how fascism pretends to unveil a deeper truth, as if all knowledge is already present in nature. As if there's nothing more to learn, ever. Truth has already been spelled out once and for all, and we can only keep interpreting its obscure message. So the bigot teaches you a bigoted idea, then gaslights you into thinking that you had that idea first, and that bigotry is simply a naturally occurring truth rather than an ideology. I want to turn to my favorite example of Eliot's criticism, his response to George Orwell's Animal Farm. Animal Farm is an animal allegory for Soviet Russia, where violent, tyrannical pigs are stand-ins for Lenin and Stalin. In 1944, Orwell submitted the novel to the publishing house Faber and Faber, where Eliot rejected it for publication, saying, Your pigs are far more intelligent than the other animals, and therefore the best qualified to run the farm. In fact, there couldn't have been an animal farm at all without them, so that what was needed, some might argue, was not more communism, but more public-spirited pigs. To Eliot, some people, or pigs, are inherently superior to others and have a God-given right to dominate. To him, the idea of a dictator isn't necessarily bad, you just need the right kind of dictator. We don't need those stinky communist pigs, we need royalists, or Nazis, or fascist pigs. We just need public-spirited pigs, benevolent dictators who we can hand total power to without question, and then hope that they're nice to us filthy normies. We just need a kindly old Deuteronomy. Reincarnate me, daddy, meow. Reflecting on Eliot's criticism of Orwell, I can't help but think more about the words authoritarian and dictator, and how, in an extremely literal sense, those terms describe someone who authors or dictates national politics and culture. We see this in real time every day. When a reporter asks Donald Trump a question, the question is worded as, do you take responsibility? No, I don't take responsibility at all. He gets to define the terms and even define the limits and responsibilities of his own office, apparently. Similarly, Eliot was trying to be a kind of dictator of literature, controlling what kinds of emotions and ideas were allowed to be represented. And that's why the Western canon is so white and male. Bigots like Eliot have engaged in an ethnic cleansing campaign on literature for centuries. Hey, George Orwell, do you have any criticisms of Eliot you'd like to share? Oh, you do? Okay, cool. In the early 1940s, Eliot published a set of four poems called The Four Quartets. A fragment from those poems were adapted into the song The Moments of Happiness in Cats. Orwell just happened to write a review of Four Quartets. In order for this to make complete sense, it helps to know that Marshal Patin was a French officer who the Nazis put in charge of Vichy France during World War II as a puppet of Nazi Germany. So Orwell writes, Obviously, a skepticism about democracy and a disbelief in progress are an integral part of Eliot. Without them, he could not have written a line of his works. But the negative Patanism, which turns its eyes to the past, accepts defeat, writes off earthly happiness as impossible, mumbles about prayer and repentance, and thinks it's a spiritual advance to see life as a pattern of living worms in the guts of the women of Canterbury. That surely is the least hopeful road a poet could take. 
Eliot's poetry was such a bummer that even George Orwell, who went on to write 1984, was like, dude, lighten up. And Orwell is getting to an idea that I mentioned earlier. Eliot was a poet who refused to use his imagination to imagine a better world. Orwell's writing says, Stuff sucks, but it could and should be better. Eliot's writing says, Stuff sucks, so how about you just go and die now, you worthless nobody, as I live in extreme comfort and absolute privilege. And to put this in context, Orwell wrote his criticism in 1942, as World War II was raging in Europe. As ethnic minorities, LGBTQIA people, and political prisoners were being rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Just as Eliot thought that the true tragedy of World War I was the decline of European aristocracy, apparently he saw World War II not as a horrific attack on democracy by authoritarians, but rather as an opportunity for the newly democratic governments that he hated to roll over so that Hitler and Mussolini could bring about a world order that more closely resembled his royalist fantasies. Isn't it wild that this video started out being about cats and we've ended up here? It's an amazing example of how someone's personal beliefs are ever-present in their writing. Eliot was highly aware of that fact, actually, when he wrote this in his 1927 essay, A Note on Poetry and Belief. I cannot see that poetry can ever be separated from something which I should call belief. And he repeated that sentiment in The Use of Poetry and Use of Criticism. One's taste in poetry cannot be isolated from one's other interests and passions. Of course, like any good fascist sympathizer, Eliot was also a massive hypocrite. Here's Eliot responding to criticisms of his poetry, The Wasteland, by claiming, eh, it doesn't really mean anything, and you're all reading too much into it. Various critics have done me the honor to interpret the wasteland in terms of criticism of the contemporary world, have considered it, indeed, as an important bit of social criticism. To me, it was only the relief of a personal and wholly insignificant grouse against life. It is just a piece of rhythmical grumbling. That's the early 20th century version of keep your politics out of my video games. Eliot claims that you cannot divorce your poetry from your beliefs, but then also refuses to allow that same kind of interpretation of his own work. The rules do not apply to the king. Of course, his poetry is political because all art is political, meow. It's like he knows his ideas are awful, but instead of interrogating why he feels this way, he runs from his emotions. Like in that earlier quote where Eliot said, Poetry is not a turning loose of emotions, but an escape from emotion. What are you trying to escape from, man? In that same essay, he also makes this weird argument about how we need to depersonalize poetry. He gives an example from chemistry, where he compares a poet to a bar of platinum. Eliot describes the metal, or poet, as inert, neutral, unchanged. He desperately wants to remain unaffected by anything, which is Basically the equivalent of turning off your humanity? What the hell is the point of poetry if your goal is to remain unaffected? It's like he sees emotions as toxic chemicals and he's dressed himself up in an emotional hazmat suit to avoid ever feeling anything. And after shielding himself, he turns around and uses literary criticism as a baseball bat to beat the emotion out of any poem or novel unfortunate enough to be viewed by his cold, dead eyes. Because if Elliot doesn't feel it, those emotions must be perverse. Weirdly, Andrew Lloyd Webber also denies the deeper meaning behind his own work. Theater director Harold Prince recalled the moment when Webber first played the score of Cats for him, saying, I looked at him curiously and said, Andrew, I don't understand. Is this about English politics? Are, are, are those cats Queen Victoria, Prime Minister Gladstone, and Prime Minister Disraeli? He looked at me like I lost my mind and after the longest pause said, Hal, this is just about cats. But in this behind the scenes video from The Cats, the musical YouTube channel, Weber straight up says that you cannot understand cats without understanding the source material of Eliot's work. Really, when cats really works at its best, it's when we remember the central premise of T.S. Eliot's writing. So if the central premise of Eliot's writing is a miserable anti-humanism that resembles the ideas of a Nazi stooge, if his writing contains anti-progressive misogyny and blatant royalism, then what does Weber think he's saying by adapting Eliot's writing into cats? Remember the central premise of T.S. Eliot's writing. 
In his 1920 essay, Hamlet and His Problems, spoiler alert, T.S. Eliot thinks that the most celebrated Shakespeare play has many problems, Eliot argues that every emotion in a work of art must correlate to a specific material object or a set of physical actions in that work. He calls this theory the objective correlative, since the object must correlate to an emotion. He argues that if there's no concrete metaphor, then the emotions aren't valid and the piece of art will be a failure. As if emotions and poetry are somehow objects or tools to be used for a specific job. I have his mojo. Instead of things to be felt to enrich your life. Elliot's opinion on emotions also reminds me of Kirk Cameron, who conveniently sees physical objects as proof of God's love. This is a celebration of the eternal God taking on a material body. So it's right that our holiday is marked with material things. Elliot argues that Hamlet is an absolute failure of a play because there is no object that correlates to Hamlet's feeling of existential dread. Which is kind of funny because the absence of a symbolic object is kind of the perfect metaphor for existential dread, but that's besides the point. <laughs> Since we already know that Elliot is scared of his own emotions and that he's a bootlicking royalist, it becomes clear that Elliot's hatred of Hamlet is actually rooted in the play's radical questioning of the cosmic order, its doubt in the existence of an afterlife, and its violent conclusion where the entire royal family is slaughtered. Now compare Hamlet to Eliot's favorite Shakespeare play, Coriolanus. Coriolanus is a story of a successful Roman general who has become so popular, he's pretty much assured to be elected consul, one of the state's highest political offices. But Coriolanus despises commoners and only runs for consul because his controlling mother pressures him into it. He hates the poor so much, he can't even be polite to them long enough to get elected. Why should the people give one that speaks thus their voice? I'll give my reasons more worthier than their voices! The Romans exile Coriolanus for his insults, so he turns traitor and joins the enemy Volsci army to march on Rome for the final confrontation. Eliot hates the play where the main character questions the nature of royalty, and he loves the play where the main character takes a steaming dump on democracy. But Eliot's love of Coriolanus is also fascinating because I think Eliot misses the actual point of the play. The character Coriolanus isn't just portrayed as being anti-democracy. Shakespeare goes out of his way to show us that there is something fundamentally wrong with Coriolanus's emotional state, that his wrath is a perversion of nature. Early in the play, Valeria, a friend of Coriolanus's wife and mother, says that she saw Coriolanus's son catch a beautiful butterfly. The boy teased the insect for a while, then put it between his teeth and ripped it apart. Coriolanus's mother responds by saying, on one's father's moods, which means <laughs> just like his dad. Much later in the play, as daddy Coriolanus is headed for Rome at the head of the Volsci army, the terrified Romans describe Coriolanus as someone who is just as eager to murder little insects as he is to murder his fellow Romans. Coriolanus' lack of empathy and his lust for violence against the lower class is an ideology that's teachable, and he's passed it down to his own son. I wonder what type of children's books Coriolanus reads to his son at night. Speaking of emotionally unwell characters eating bugs... You might have seen this clip going around on Twitter because it's horrifying. And while it may seem like just another random, hilarious clip from this weird movie, the lyrics are pulled almost verbatim from Eliot's poetry. She thinks that the cockroaches just need employment to prevent them from idle and wanton destroyment. So she's formed from a lot of disorderly louts, a troop of well-disciplined, helpful boy scouts. It's like conservative propaganda in poem form. Cockroach is a term commonly used by racists to describe various ethnic minorities and immigrants. And this series of lines reads as a list of negative stereotypes. That minorities are lazy and jobless, that they're prone to violence and crime. Plus, there are a pool of people seen as exploitable for military recruitment. What's most upsetting about this whole scene, though, is Jenny Anydots' joy. Hooper and Weber may or may not be aware of it, but there is something fundamentally wrong with Jenny Anydots' emotional state. And no, it is not the unzipping of the skin. I grew up on SpongeBob. Unzipping your skin to reveal more skin and then doing it again to reveal a third layer of skin isn't weird to me. It just makes sense. I would do it every day if I could. Sorry. No, what's upsetting is seeing Jenny Any Dots casually eat her own entertainment. We see just how disposable these commoners are. She swallows them without a second thought, with no regard for their inferior insect lives. 
more than maybe any other scene in the entire film. The cockroach scene shows how absurd the ideology within the society of cats is. This scene feels so wrong because we see the bugs' faces and we recognize them as human. Then we see Rebel Wilson's face and we recognize her as human. So we're seeing a human eat other humans with no sense of guilt, no sense of being emotionally affected at all. And the bugs just keep on dancing and smiling without missing a beat. In fascism or royalism or whatever you want to call it, the lower classes are expected to accept their role without question. This is what Elliot meant when he said Animal Farm needed more public-spirited pigs. We need leaders who will smile as they lead you to your death. Can someone please tell me that they are not posing in the shape of a Nazi flag? Please, just someone reassure me. Literally, actually, I know that this is not the Nazi flag, but if someone could just make like an hour-long video just saying, Maggie, that has nothing to do with Nazis. Because later, they all hold up their hands like this! And it was written by a Nazi sympathizer! I'm sorry, I know that this has nothing to do with anything. I've just been in lockdown for days and I've just seen this movie so, so many times. Anyways, here's some poetry that I'm really proud of. Elliot was, like many others, a silly human, we'd say. Afraid of his own kind, his own people, his own face. Who believes poetry can only say what has already been said explicitly? Who strangely believed there are traits by ethnicity? But he's long and gone and cannot utter a word, which is maybe better from all that I've heard. But since he never reached out for comment, never went tit for tat, you know, know of Elliot from the view. Mm. Of a cat. So why do I enjoy this trash fire of a movie? It's kind of hard to put into words and I spent the better part of an hour trying. You have this work of art that on one level is unquestionably rooted in fascist propaganda, but on an aesthetic level it's revolting and seemingly inane. And at the same time I also find it strangely pretty in a horrifying gaudy kind of way, and Idris Elba exudes sexuality, and the dancing rules, and the music is really catchy, even if the new version's audio mix is terrible. It's as if this movie shows you fascism, but then also makes you revolted by that same fascism, unintentionally, with an added scoop of expressive dance. Maybe it's accidentally clockwork oranging you, brainwashing you into disliking the ideas that are contained within the movie itself. <laughs> Or maybe it's like Springtime for Hitler, an accidental parody of itself? I don't really know. I love the experience of cats. It's like they were trying to paint a modernist masterpiece, but as they were painting it, they tripped down the stairs. So they ended up with this whole other surreal mess of spilled paint that's also a masterpiece in its own way. Overall, it's an experience that I can't put into words. But that's okay, because not every experience or emotion can be reduced to a simple object or sentence, Mr. Elliot. And that's what the experience of cats feels like to me. It feels like the inability to express my own emotions in mere words. It makes me want to be more conscious of my own feelings that I don't have words for. And I think that's beautiful. So thank you, Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber. Thank you, T.S. Eliot, and thank you, Tom Hooper, for making me fall in love with the two-hour experience of realizing that you're all a bunch of hacks. <laughs> thank you so much for watching, and a very special thank you to all of my patrons, without whom this video would not be possible. If you want to help me make more videos like this, head over to patreon.com slash Mayfish. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next one. You can follow me and all of the lovely people who lent me their voice on Twitter. Links in the description. Stay safe, thanks again, and save Martha.